welcome you who are called and you have, who have been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ and welcome you who have not yet been yet but are here because you seek life in his name. I love these pictures that we started with and um, keep them coming. We'll do another, uh, another week of these. They're great because as we say that we are baptized, we affirm that we are loved, that we belong to Jesus because of his death and resurrection. No matter what happens in these difficult days, we are his. But we also say that we belong to each other. We are the community of those that are baptized into Jesus. Separate, distanced, yet always together and joined and this week is also Christian Unity Week, the week we pray for the unity of the church. So it's good this week particularly to remember that we are part of that worldwide family of people that are baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so we come and we wait on him. Last week I read from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 is a great chapter. If you're looking for encouragement and reassurance, read Isaiah 40. I read last week from the start of it that talked about going through the waters and the fires and God being with us. Let me read it today from the end of it. It says this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. My word of the week has been scunnered. And that's how many of us feel right now in January in the midst of lockdown. But we come today affirmed. For we belong to Jesus Christ. And we come today encouraged because as we wait on him, he will renew us and he will hold us up. So let's begin our worship as we listen to the words together of strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. <laughs> Wait. 
Let's come together, shall we, in prayer. Father, we have tried. We have tried too long in our own strength. We have tried to manage. We have tried to go on. Lord, we come before you because we struggle. We fail. And sometimes it might even become too much. And so we turn to you, Lord. You are the everlasting God. You are the creator of the ends of the earth. You hold all things in your hand. You know the beginning from the end. There is nothing too much for you. And you don't grow tired or weary. You don't even grow tired of us in our feelings and our struggles. And so this morning we turn to you. And we ask, Lord, this morning that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us. That you would send that Holy Spirit to fill us and strengthen us, to comfort us to bring our hearts and our minds back to you. To give strength when we are weary and power when we are weak. To lift us up when it seems that we are going to stumble and fall and to give us again new hope, renewed strength in you. We seek today your forgiveness we seek today a new joy in knowing your love for us. We seek today that our hearts would turn to you and we would depend on you. For you are dependable. And we pray those words that Jesus taught us to pray, our daily prayer of surrender to you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins just as we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from this time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom. The power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. We come this morning. Although apart. Together to hear God's word. And Elaine's going to come and read from us. The next episode. In the story of Elijah. This morning's reading is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17. We're starting at verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerth ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food here. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. 
So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, Your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. Thanks, Elaine. Let's pray. Father, we come to your word through the prophet Elijah and we ask this morning by your Holy Spirit that this would become your word for us. Amen. What an entrance Elijah makes in the first verse of this passage. Here is King Ahab, the king of Israel, and the king is leading the people of Israel astray. He's leading them to worship the Baals, to to worship false gods. He's leading them in all sorts of immorality. And Elijah turns up and says, God is alive. There will be no rain. Boom. That's it. God's judgment on the people. So this passage began in 1 Kings, Kings chapter 17 with the, Elijah as the strongest of prophets. He's taking the pagans on right, um, right to their faces. He's confronting a king and later on we will find him as the one who brings judgment on the 400 prophets of Baal, brings fire down from heaven and faces up to Queen Jezebel who is leading the people even further astray. This is no namby-pamby prophet with gentle words, but the full strength of God. But that's not the full story. That's just the first verse. You see, if all we had here was a strong man, a man full of strength and words and power, then we might think that story encouraging, but we might also think that story's not us. We're weak and we struggle. But here's the thing. That's only the first verse. The next 23 verses of this passage of Elijah hiding. Elijah socially confined. Elijah in lockdown, as it were. Elijah simply living by a brook or in the house as a lodger of a poor widow. And if you read the stories in these chapters of Elijah, you'll find that this cycle will repeat itself. 
the man of public strength who everybody thinks is so close to God with all of God's power. And yet we also find him vulnerable, broken, struggling. At one point, it seems like he has some sort of a mental and emotional breakdown. And we're invited to see his inner life. It's a bit of the paradox of Christian identity. We are God's people. We are called to speak his word by the Holy Spirit to the world. We're called to be priests. We're called to be those who witness to the truth that changes the universe. We're called to speak boldly. And yet, we also read a Bible that deals gently with us that talks of a God who points out our inadequacies, our sinfulness, our brokenness. And so I want us this morning to journey with Elijah into that hidden life of those 23 verses. For it is if God says to Elijah, yeah, I want you to be bold for me. But if this is going to work, I'm going to have to teach you some things. I'm going to have to work with you, on you, so that you can be my man. This chapter we might, in, we might call Pro- prophet's boot camp as God takes Elijah into the wilderness and teaches him something of who God really is. The first part of the boot camp happens by the ravine at Kerith. Elijah is told to go there and depend on God. He drinks from the brook that brings water, uh, water at a time where there's suddenly been drought in the whole land, and there he's fed by ravens. I, I love the expression, the ravens bring him two meals a day. This isn't just meals on wheels coming to keep you alive. The ravens come and they bring him bread, and they bring him meat. Now, for folk in, in, in that sort of um, culture, eating meat twice a day was what kings did. This was fantastic. He's having sausages for breakfast and steak for dinner. God is not just looking after him. He's making his plate, his cup rather, flow until it's running over. He is having it really good in prophet's boot camp. In a sense, the lesson he's being taught here is the same lesson that the children of Israel had to learn as they came out of the promise, sorry, they came out of the land of Egypt and they went through the desert. They were fed by the manna. You'll remember the story in the whales as God taught them to grow up in him, to learn that he could be trusted, that he would provide everything for them. It's one of the very important lessons of faith for us as Christians, that we need to learn that we are utterly dependent on God. All the things we think that we provide for ourselves are actually the gifts of his grace and his goodness. I wonder that one of the things that we learn perhaps in our boot camp of this crisis that we're in at the moment is how little control we actually have over our own lives, how everything that once we took for granted, we just thought it would come, we now have to appreciate is actually God's gift and we are actually in his hands. Our plans for our lives, for our church, for our holidays, all of these things suddenly don't look so sensible and we have to look to God. Why is it important that Elijah learns this? Well, you see, he's to be a prophet to Israel. And where is Israel at the moment? Israel's in a place where it's stating its independence. We don't need to follow God. We can follow any God we like. We can pick our own God. We can follow this God or that God. We can do what we want. We can even provide our own reign. It's a society that's ignored God. And Elijah's going to be called to bring them back to tell them of the one true God, that they are really dependent on him. But before Elijah can bring that word, he has to learn that word. It has to be true for him. And I think that's what God's teaching him in his boot camp out there by the brook. Do we yearn for a society that once again finds prayer? 
Do we yearn for a society which once again puts God at the center of things, that teaches the next generation, the children, the schools, everything about the one true God? If we yearn for that, then the first question is this. Are we willing ourselves to learn dependence on him? Jesus said this, and it's always struck me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. But he goes on to say, apart from me, cut off from me, trying to do it yourself, you can do nothing. I wonder how much we try to do as a church, as individuals, and God comes and says, it is nothing. You need to depend on me. So Elijah learns the lesson of trusting God for his food each day, but that's just the start. The brook dries up. It's interesting, verse 7 says simply it dried up, and you think, why did it dry up? Well, it dried up because there was no rain. Why was there no rain? Because that's what Elijah had said through the word of God. It began to hit him personally in his life. And then we're told very simply in verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 9 that he was directed to go to Zarephath and stay there. And there there would be a widow supplying him with food. See, here's the second lesson. Elijah's learned to depend on God for his food, and now God says this, I want you to learn to depend on someone else. It won't be enough that you'll be my strong man and you'll depend on me, that you'll be some sort of lone gunman out there just depending on your spiritual strength on me. You're going to need to depend on other people. You're going to need to be vulnerable enough to depend even on a widow. I wonder that one of the things that we've been taught in these days of lockdown is simply this. We need other people. I um, think one of the dangers in ministry is that you begin to think that you're indispensable, that other people need you. I've been aware just how much I've learned about myself in how much I need other people. I depend on the company of my family. This week was turned around because one friend phoned me up just to see how I was, and another friend said, let's go for a walk. These simple things that remind us that we need other people. We find it practically at the moment, don't we? We need the postman, that bring, we need the delivery driver. We're aware of the shop owner and all the people that bring us the services that we need. We need the scientists, we need the doctors, we need all of these things for our life to go on. We need each other. And if that's true in society, it's true of us in the church as well. You know, how many mornings have we got up when we could go to church and gather together and we thought, oh, it's church today. I don't think we'll ever think that again. We will be aware of the real privilege it is to gather together. The real privilege it is to have a conversation, to have a coffee, to go into someone's house. These things are vital for us. We need each other. One of the biggest heresies of our day is that independence is a good thing. If I cannot depend on other people, if I don't have to ask people for help, if I don't have to look like I'm weak, if I don't have to tell people my woes, then I am strong. And yet the Bible tells us exactly the opposite. We need each other. If you are born again into the family of God, then you are given brothers and sisters and you are given them for a purpose. Elijah was to learn that. It also means that we need to be humble enough to ask for help. I, I, I have said in, in these times um, 
we should help each other. And I, I know as congregation, we will do that. We will want to help if, if I can do anything for anyone else. But here's the bigger challenge. Are you humble enough to phone someone up and say, I need to talk? Are you strong enough to phone your minister or your elder or your friend and say, I need your prayers? To reach out to someone and say, I need you. I am dependent on you. I think that's the second lesson that Elijah was to learn here. As God said, I'm going to make you dependent on someone. And he was to be made dependent on a widow. But there's more to it than that. Zarapeth was about 100 miles up north. There it is on the map there. He'd started off down at the brook in Kerith, and then he had been taken right up into Zarapeth, which is in Phoenicia, or Sidon, as the Bible says. The significance of that is that not only has he gone to a widow, he's gone to a widow who lives right up north, outside of the land of Israel, in the country of the Baals themselves, of these pagan gods. And there, the widow will feed him. Elijah lowers his sights. He'd had two meals a day. He'd had the meat. When he sees the little widow, he suddenly realizes this is going to be hard. He says, can I have a little bit of water? Then having thought a bit, he says, and just a little bread. And even there, the widow comes and says, I, I don't have these things. It's not just that Elijah's been taught to trust someone else. He's been humbled as he has to depend on someone who seems so much weaker than him. And this woman isn't a sort of prophetic fangirl who's dead keen to look after prophets. No, she's not even a believer in God. She's a pagan. She lives up here in Baal country. And look in verse 12 what she says. She says to Elijah, as surely as the Lord your God lives. It's a classic pagan argument. I've got my God, you've got your God. I worship the God of Canaan, you worship the God of Israel, and there's a God of Egypt and another God and a whole load of gods. She's a polytheist, believing in lots of different gods. Just as an aside, that's the philosophy of our day, isn't it? Oh, there's lots of different religions and they're all the same, is what people tell us. It's a, really quite a bizarre thing. Imagine people saying that, well, there's lots of different types of politics. You know, there's communism and fascism and there's Trumpism and there's Joe Biden and there's Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon, but, you know, they're all just the same. And yet people will say that of religion no, they're not all the same. And Elijah, Elijah is the one who follows the truth. He follows the true living God. His whole message will be to bring the word of this true God and to shut up the prophets of Baal. That will be his calling, and we will see that in the later chapters. But here's what God is doing in boot camp. He's teaching him, first of all, to relate to the very pagans that he's later going to be denouncing. He's been taught something very deep about God, I think, here. That God is even working with the people who don't know him and don't want to know him. Elijah will later on confront another woman, Jezebel. And Jezebel has become notorious as the evil queen. She's Ahab's wife and she's the true power behind the throne. She's a ghastly person. She's a person who's trying to persecute God's prophets. But here's the interesting thing. Jezebel is from Sidon. And Elijah is sent to Zarephath in Sidon. And I wonder that as God is doing that, he's saying, yes, I will need you to be strong and I will need you to denounce the pagans and I will need you to stand up to the woman who lead people astray. But before you do any of that, you need to understand something about me. I love these people even when I have strong words to say to them. So go and be her house guest. 
depend on her generosity, share her pain and her lot and her poverty. Stand with her. And as you do that, you'll learn not just something about women from Sidonia. You'll learn something about me in that boot camp. God wants strong men and women. He wants a church that is ready to speak out his truth to society, even when that's painful. But first, he needs a church that's going to be dependent on him, a church that's going to learn his heart and his love for people that seem so far away from him. And notice what Elijah does. He's to win a whole nation back. He's to bring the whole of the Israelite people back to God. And yet he starts off with this one pagan woman. And as he shares her life, he invites her to share his trust in God. Take the step of faith. Trust in God with a little jar. Trust in God with a little bit of water and the little bit of bread you have. And see as we together share this house Find God's faithfulness together. Then the next thing, of course, is that they share pain together. The widow's son dies. And she's full of questions. What have you got against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? It's, it, 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 it's a question in pain and we, we find people when we, when we suffer we ask those really difficult questions does God hate us that much that this would happen what have you got against me now if Elijah was just being the strong man who he later will be as he denounces the prophets of Baal and you, you, you'll know the story in chapter 19 where he stands up on top of Mount Carmel and brings fire down from heaven he might have said well you know what yes I have come to remind you of your sin I have come to tell you that you're a pagan and that you're worshipping the wrong God. And as for, 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 for the death of your son, well, you know, you're Israel's enemies. But no, because God's taught something else to Elijah as he became dependent and shared his life with this widow. He'd learned something of God's love. And so Elijah's first response when this woman yells in pain at the death of her son, yells at heaven, yells at God with, his, with her questions, is that he joins her. Oh Lord, why have you done this? What is this about? And then he begins to pray to God. And as he does that, God answers the prayers and the boy is brought back to life. And notice at the end of this passage, the woman says something quite remarkable. She says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Here's this pagan suddenly at the end of all of this that they've gone through together saying, I believe in your God, in the truth of your God, in the truth of the one Lord who made heaven and earth. Elijah will bring fire from heaven as he boldly proclaims God's truth in chapter 19. But just now, it's in standing beside this woman, in being dependent on her, in sharing his life with her, that he begins to see her life turned round. This is all that Elijah learned at that time to depend on God to depend on others and something of God's heart for each and every person and that third lesson was a difficult lesson because we instinctively want to look after our own we instinctively want to look after our church and God is telling us something about his heart for other people as well it's interesting that when Jesus preached his very first sermon, the people of Nazareth hated it. And they hated it because he preached on this very text. You see, they wanted a strong man who'd be their Messiah and their deliverer, 
and he began to speak of someone with a heart for other people. Here's what Jesus preached in Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Jesus here is speaking of God's heart for people that are outside of our experience. God's heart for people who don't share our faith. God's heart for people who aren't one of us. And they hated it then. And the church still struggles with it today. So here is the smelting point of Zarephath. The place where Elijah had so much to learn. To learn to depend on God. To learn the humility to depend on those that God gave him. And to learn of God's love. God's compassion. God's care. In our day, in our struggles, in our lockdown, what are the lessons that God is teaching us as we depend on him, as we reach out to each other, and as we are called not just to look to ourselves, but to see his love for every part of this broken world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are yours. That we belong to you. We thank you that you've given us in your word the truth. For Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. We thank you that your church has a bold message to proclaim that brings life to the world, that confronts evil, that speaks of your most excellent way. And yet, Lord, today we pray not just that you would renew us in that strength, but that you would teach us again our dependence on you. That in Jesus you wash us you forgive us, you heal us and you keep us, you restore us and you strengthen us. Grant to us, we pray, humility, an ability to love as you love, to care as you care. On this Sunday of Christian Unity Week, Lord, we would pray for the people that you've given us. We pray for our church here, that although we are apart, that you would unite us. We pray just now for the folk that we would be sitting by, if we could be in the building together. But we pray beyond that, for the full family that you've given us. For the children that we've promised to raise and teach of you. For the other congregations in our neighborhood, in this town of Motherwell. For your church throughout Scotland. In all of its denominational difference, we pray. Unite us and teach us and keep us in you. Oh Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts, not just for truth, but also for compassion. that you would teach us patience in our trusting and our living, forgiveness, and today we pray, Lord, that you would give us the grace to reach out to one another in need and the humility to admit our own need. And Lord, we come and in compassion, we cry out for those who mourn today. For those that are feeling 
overwhelmed by all that is happening, by those who are feeling trapped or depressed, for those that are in homes where things are not happy, and for those that have to make decisions on our behalf, we pray. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to hear the words now of a song that is well known, but invites us to come and to trust in Jesus Christ. day we come to him. On this, the Lord's day, we admit our dependence on him. On this, the Lord's day, we seek his strength and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and strengthen you this day and forever. Amen. I will dwell within the shelter of the God who reigns above. I will 
rest beneath the shadow of the mighty King of Love. Though a sickness hides in darkness, though a plague destroys my day, I will stand upon His promises. Christ will be my hideaway. In you, my God, I trust. You are strong and dear with us. In you, my hope remains. Christ will be my hideaway. Angels gather to protect me when they hear my Savior call. Sovereign hands are ever ready to uphold me should I fall. Safe beneath His wings of refuge. All my fears are kept at bay. I am shielded by His faithfulness. Christ will be my hideaway. In you, my God, I trust. You are strong. And fall around me, though death looks me in the eye. Evil shall not have the victory while the Lord is at my side. God in power raised my Savior. I no longer fear. i